I'm not saying there's no place for the mirror phase in a coherent neuroevolutionary paradigm. I'm saying we have to expand beyond the optical metaphor to include species that aren't visually dominant. Oh, hi. I'm two-time Cable Ace Award nominee Layman Pascal. You might remember me from such made-for-TV movies as The Gunny Sack Gambit and Timelines Ahoy, the Sean Gebser story. Today on the integral stage, following this obligatory burst of jovial hyperlinguistic nonsense, we'll be chatting with a fellow with whom I had a lovely time alone in the woods last summer. Alexander Love is a thoughtful acolyte of transpersonal spaces who combines a Western appreciation of evolutionary models, pluralistic psychology, and developmental cognitive theories with um, an intimate understanding of Asian philosophy, symbolism, and the healing arts. He's working on a book. He joined me to co-present the God Session that concluded the recent Utah conference, and I hear he's a damn fine lacrosse player despite that gimpy leg. Ladies and gentlemen, and everything else, it's Alexander Love. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, man. Thank you, Damon. What a, what a lovely introduction. Best introduction I've ever had. That's what I like to hear. Did you grow up with the family name Love? Like, is that your birth name? In fact, it is. Yeah, my uh, um, my my family is was Jewish, um, and uh, the story goes is our name was originally Yudelovich, and so when they when they traveled to this country, they it was changed to Love, and um, so yes, even though I live in Boulder, I didn't uh, change my last name <laughs> after a course on enlightenment. Do you think being Mister Love has influenced your orientation in life? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that I, uh, I didn't really realize that my last name was Love until I was uh, in my first couple years of college. There, there, uh, there. I was in music school, and I remember the day that it dawned on me that I was like, "Wait a minute, my last name is Love," as in like love, love. And um, I don't know if it's influenced me. It certainly has been. I mean, love has certainly been. Um, one of the most important things in my exploration of human suffering. And so um, it certainly hasn't hurt to have that last name as a reminder. I love that anecdote because one of the, one of the things that delights me the most about sort of a developmental lifestyle, if that's what we're living, is this, um, periodically rediscovering the meaning of things. I was in a, in the woods one time. It was like my late 20s. And I was like, oh, this is what forest means, right? And like, nominally, I'd known that word since I was three. But now you're like, whoa. But you keep having those periodically. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me, uh, uh, Jill Thomas, she brought up at one of the CC gatherings that respect means to look again, to respect. And um, yeah, that's what comes up when you say that sort of a, a looking again and a looking again and a looking again and a sort of re-encountering the living history as something that's bursting here now. One of the most common and, and least talked about aspects of um, what it's like for people who are participating in some ongoing developmental journey is this increasing appreciation for etymology. Like in, when you read the books of people in different time periods who we might resonate with, you know, they're very often looking back, like breaking down the words, looking for the roots, reappreciating some kind of additional set of meanings they can work into their own existing vocabulary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I think maybe it, there's, there's some element in that of, the desire to see through to the essences of things. Um, one of my all-time favorite words is diaphaneity, the kind of, the kind of, the, 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 the something through which light can pass. And, and I think that there's this, maybe for, for, for many, many humans, this sort of pull towards origin, which can show up in many different ways, whether we're looking at the root of words or the root of what the hell is a forest or what is that last name about anyway? And how does one, you know, live into that? But my sense is, is that there's, there's some, there, there's some uh, impulse or magnetic pull into that sense of, you know, what is, what is at the essence of what we are and, and what we're, what we're doing here? There's a beautiful ambiguity in words like essence and origin, because 
is it something ancient or primordial or eternal or is it something that's been newly produced in that moment of discovery and complexification and then how do we hold both of those in some way that makes sense how do you hold both of those in some way that makes sense <laughs> well i i like to think of it in terms of um i like to think of you know evolution's engine being a revolution with sprouts that there's this kind of and the revolution part is the enfolding there's the the, 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 you could say the receiving of the involutionary pouring in of last moment. And, 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 and so there's that, there's that, there's that revolution that then froths. And, and if we look at it from a process perspective, that's that revolution with sprouts has been occurring since there's been anything occurring. So, so in that, it's like, in my experience, it's like this very moment is receiving the last 14 billion years or however many moments have existed since something started to exist. And so I think of it as like that, that, that involutionary pouring in, like the, like the dropping in of last moments fruit that then becomes this moment's seeds from which then that next bursting can occur. And in this way, the past, the present and the future are, are all, um, uh, interdependently co-born um, in, in this living moment. It, it reminds me of um, James Baldwin speaking to how, you know, history is not the past. I don't remember the exact quote. It's easily, it's easy to find, but it's something to the effect of the history is not the past. And, and if we don't recognize that we basically become criminals is what he's, is what he's saying there. And to me, I love that distinction because the past we kind of think of it as like something ancient that exists before, but in creating that differentiation between the past and history, to me it allows history to be living, something that's enfolded where that ancientness is existent right now, as well as all of the horrors and all of the blossoms that, that have occurred in our cosmic sort of passage. What came up for me was being in school in uh, January of 1990, and me and my friends started trying to get an 80s retro thing going in January <laughs> of 1990. But when I sat down to think, what the hell are we doing? My sense was like, oh, the further into the future we go, the more retro there's going to be. Like tomorrow <laughs> contains more of the past than today does. How does some, there's something about the shape of time in that folding. Yeah. One thing, though, I'm, you know, when I, when we think about the present receiving the past, mm -hmm. I'm very aware that I can't tell how much of the past can be received. Like when they tell you about like the amount of the visible universe that we can see, right? There's a certain amount, there's a distance a photon can travel before it's been interfered with by so many waves that it can't give you any information anymore. So you're like, that's as far as you can receive. And do you think like we receive the entire past or do you think there's a certain amount of the past beyond which it becomes imperceivable to us and we're only receiving 14 billion or 100 billion or some specific but vast past? I, I mean, of course, I don't know. My, my sense is that uh, we receive all of it, but that some of it is in latency. Most of it is in latency. It's in a it's in a a, um, a kind of slumber. Um, of course, that's what diaphaneity is, and and it seems like the the ability to begin to see through to more and more of the whole that that we are. Um, so yeah, my sense is that we bring it we bring it all forward. Um, but but when I it's you know it's almost as if on the one hand to be able to apprehend all of it in conscious space um it certainly makes my nervous system get a little nervous um and, and it, it i wonder if as we grow up our ability to reach i'm going to say reach back i don't actually mean back but reach into at more and more of that that wholeness that we are um perhaps those things co-occur um so that as someone grows in in compl embodied complexity they may have more access to molecularity 
um, to, you know, the direct apprehension of, you know, the, the, the material ground of existence um, to the, the emergence of life and all its myriad sort of iterations, as well as the, you know, it's if any of us who've done shadow work know that just working within our own individual psyche is, is enough. <laughs> and, and yet, of course, then we could also be living into, you know, generational shadows that are, are latent as well. So theoretically, I think we bring it all forward. Um, but I think a lot of it is, a, is in slumber. I wonder what it would be like to be able to really receive all of it. You know, and I, I suppose that would require training in the nervous system over time. But but I don't I'm not I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. I have this. If I look back at my life, I feel like the spans of time that I viscerally take seriously have increased, but also my appreciation for fundamental limits on knowability have increased. Right. <laughs> and if I look at how much if I imagine the latency of the world. There's just no way for me to tell whether it's all there latent or some of the latent, some of it just goes forever, which would make complete sense in terms of we're bounded beings somehow. <laughs> That's right. And I think, you know, I, I think different spiritual traditions have gra have grappled with these kinds of things, you know, um, practices like Tonglen where you're, you're, you know, you can work and work, you can do something like Tonglen where you're receiving the suffering of your neighbor, but you could also do... Uh, that practice to receive the suffering of everyone in Gaza. And so I think that there are there are practices and, and ways in which humans have inquired around how much of the whole can we embrace, including the whole's suffering, which is immense, and how to do that in such a way that um, a, an indivi a, a individual consciousness or consciousness that's centered in individual uh, corporeal nest, um, how to do such things where one can interact with that in a way where they're uh, able to remain somehow present. There are types of breathing practices, sometimes related to divine communion, where you breathe in the perfection and the glory of the all pervasive imminent divinity of the world and purify yourself with that and, and then surrender yourself as you breathe out. But in Tonglen practices, you breathe in the suffering and have to transmute it <laughs> and breathe something better back out. Do you think Tonglen is a more mature, more ethical, more useful practice, or are they two disparate practices for disparate things? Well, I think they can become one practice. I think that, you know, what, what comes up for me is that you know, we have virtue cultivation practices, which focus, it's, it's, it's leaning towards the seeing into the roots and the essences of things. And typically when human beings have, have attempted that, that we encounter um, qualities of virtue, qualities of being that are desirous, that are blissful. And then we have something like Tong Len where I really see Tonglen as a mixture of both. If we just try to breathe in suffering without having had any virtue cultivation, um, I think this is where we can begin to feel burdened. There's, a, there's an acupuncture point right, right on the side of the chest called Da Bao. Da means great and bao, um, many people, maybe you've had a bao bun. Uh, bao means to envelop or to wrap. So a bao bun is usually like, um, like a little thing of bread um, with inside of it, there's like a middle um, with like pork or something. A jelly donut is a bow. Uh, a uterus is a bow. And so you have this thing called great enveloping. And it's not really an acupuncture point. It's more speaking about uh, these vessels that are enveloping the heart. And when we take on suffering, and take on suffering, whether it's our own or somebody else's, without transmuting it, without a means to transmute it, it creates, um, it starts to create a burden, a sense of burden and heaviness around the heart. One of the uh, indications for this point is pain over the whole body, which you can look at metaphorically, where we see some very well-intentioned people enter the world 
uh, trying to do good, take on all of the weight of the world, and then they are their whole life is filled with pain. And so the ability or the, the practice of uh, virtue cultivation, that becomes the, um, the, the, the medicine, the, um, the love uh, that can envelop the suffering and then put it into a, invite it into an alchemical transmutation so that we take the suffering in, but then it becomes something else like a, like a high octane uh, liquid that can then power, you know, further care and um, service and um, something like that in, in the world. I like that because one of the questions around um, shadow work is sort of loosely an Eastern Western dialectic where the psychoanalytic model seems to encourage people to go in, to enter, to feel, to explore, to re-identify with material they might not have identified with. But then there's this kind of, I used to be in a group, they called it Buddhist psychology, but it was very cultivationist, right? You, you get the brain states you're practicing. And if you like try to go in and re-identify with these shadow parts, you're just practicing your bad feelings. <laughs> so you're like, how do those work together? What makes shadow work not just sh practicing and indulging in negativity and it's something like the amount of background coherence that you bring into it or the ability or the practice of alternating between the negativity and the coherence which is similar to what you were calling virtue absolutely and and you know i'm the the sh when i do parts work or shadow work with people it's very much influenced by eastern wisdom and so when we're working with a part, for example, to begin with, there's a recognition that any part, no matter how mean they are or how sad they are or how we, whatever we might call a negative emotion, however richly expressive they are of those kinds of qualities, there's a recognition that um, just like an avocado has, you know, multiple layers. And if you were to see through the avocado all the way to its seed, you'd start contacting that essence. When, when I'm working with people with parts, the invitation is actually to help first sense the fullness of what is happening in the person's psyche. So there's a sense of wanting to contact that, um, uh, that pain, whatever it is, the anger, the shame, whatever, those, whatever that stuff is. But then there's this recognition, again, coming back to inner alchemy, that things can become other things. And what occurs there is something that's more, I think, common in, in Eastern wisdom, which is this transformation of virtue, where you hang with, you know, I've, I've seen in um, like some meditation traditions where you, you, you hang with the anger until it becomes its virtue. When I'm doing shadow work and parts work with people, it's the same idea. The whole part can eventually become an expression of one's luminosity. And this becomes really helpful and practical on the ground, because if we have all these protective mechanisms within us that are making us cut off from people or making us, you know, give somebody the, you know, give somebody the finger while we're driving or cut people off or eating all the bags of chips, all that kind of stuff, those very protective mechanisms can transform into expressions of virtue. And we always end up being, uh, quote unquote, safer when we're using dimensions of luminosity as a means to protect ourselves. So if we're driving and, and there's a protector part that wants to protect us from someone who's screaming at us, emanating virtue as a quality of being is a far more effective way of staying safe than by becoming belligerent, for example. So if your book is not titled The Avocado of Diaphaneity, what is it titled? It's entitled Evolutionary Gestures uh, 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 and Adventures in Wholeness. What, what has this book been doing to you? Oh, well, I'm, I'm on the, probably the sixth draft. Um, it, it is really transforming a lot because 
I, I didn't know how much I was going to weave in my own personal story. Now, the way I'm doing that, um, you could say is sort of nonfiction magic realism, because that's the closest medium that I could find to expre express my experience and to express the truth that I've been in relationship with. Um, and so what this is, this aspect of it, the story aspect of it, what it's allowed me to do is to re-encounter um, many sort of really painful moments in my life. And just as we were speaking before, I'm not going back into the past. I'm, I'm excavating the living history inside of me as it's alive now so that it's, it's actually mixing. It's what it was, but it's also mixing with who I've become over the last 27 years since my father was killed. And it's allowed me to look closer you know, I, I recently was just working on on the the funeral experience and meeting, seeing my father lifeless for the you know for the first time, the first time I'd ever seen anybody lifeless. But being able to re encounter that more closely, to see where all the beauty is, you know, and I think this is what art does. It often, not always, but often, art looks at things that feel too horrible to bear or ugly, or something that we would wish to outcast, and then finds the beauty in it and captures that in ink, um, whether it's in the written word or whether it's you know in some other visual form, to help the rest of the world feel so compelled they have to look at it and they have to see the beauty in it. And so that aspect of this book, there's many aspects to the book, but that that aspect of it has been working me sort of in that way, helping me rediscover the, the beauty of all these spaces that I had the opportunity to walk through as such a young sort of lost and seeking human being. A couple of years ago, my father um, went into a coma and I'm far away from where it was all happening and not getting that much information. And it was, as far as I knew, he didn't necessarily want to be alive from, from conversations I knew with him. Uh, or, you know, continuing to live was not his aspiration. Yeah. And I, not knowing what I could do, ended up essentially grieving his death. But later he recovers, <laughs> has to go through physio and learn to function again. And so he's still alive, but for me, in a way, he's died. And it's a very strange situation to be in. I, I relate to him as if he's dead. And I'm trying to feel, I'm trying to be responsible to the person who's still here. But in a way, for me, he's already gone. And that, that contradiction is very interesting. I'm curious how you experience your father as both present and absent. Yeah. Well, you know, in many ways, he's more present than absent. Um, as just a just a back just some sort of a little backstory. So 27 years ago, he was murdered, and you know that that experience. You know, it's like being in relationship to the absence of something is also very much a relationship with the presence of an absence, which then over time through the grieving process, you know turns into being in the in relationship with the presence of something because if you can't if you can't touch their warm hands and you still yearn for contact you either have the option to fall into some sort of dark well of despair um, or you have to figure out how to make contact with now we can look at that in terms of you know, spiritual depth and communion. We can look at that in terms of discovering where my father lives on in me or how I see him live on in my child. Um, there's many ways to sort of identify or, or um, define what is meant by communion with. 
but I've found that, you know, being with his, his death and then also writing this book and then recently meeting with his, the person who killed him, there's very much a, a, a sense of presence and relationship with his spirit, because I know he would, he was a, he was a Zen Buddhist and he was a very kind and gentle human being, very intelligent at, uh, in many ways. And, and so I, I know that, that he is in support of this and I can feel the spirit of generosity that, and love that he gave me. We, um, my mother moved away when I was a young teenager. So my father and I were mostly, it was just the two of us in, in relationship. And so there's a way, even as I'm speaking now, it's like I can feel the warmth of that and how that comes through me as a kind of warmth. That's a little different than, you know, maybe the Alexander, you know, the artist formerly known as Alexander's warmth. Um, so it, it feels to me like there's a, it's like a, a gathering of, of all, a gathering of all all the places that maybe were hidden because pain tends to contract us and, and sort of dim light for a period of time. There's sort of a continuing opening into his, his warmth. It's kind of like, you know, like cinnamon. This um, meeting with his killer is very interesting to people not to a sociopath like me but you know to the people <laughs> um and obviously it's part of your your story and your personal unfolding but it's also um a demonstration of principles of healing and curiosity and leaning into hard conversations it has a community function as well which i commend um What's what surprised you? In, in what ways did it not play out the way you might have anticipated it playing out? Well, I guess I well I'll say it this way: I, I tried not to anticipate too much, because you know this this human being has had a, a, a whatever you could conceive of as a nightmare of a childhood like times it by a hundred and it would start getting close to what this human being went through as a young human being. And so I, I, I didn't know what I was going to be interacting with as a human being and, and the counselors who meet with both of us separately ahead of time, you know, they initially were, you know, just wanting to prepare me like, you know, this person hasn't had years of emotional intelligence opportunities and, um, and maybe it'll come across as harsh. And what surprised me is that it didn't in any way. That within a few moments of being with Herbert, I I didn't want to leave. I was like, I, I mean, the 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 actual words were like, I I want this to last forever, because I could see his goodness immediately, and I was surprised by how much love was present in my heart. And I'm, I'm being really specific because there was plenty of love around us and th through us. That was a given, that was stable. That was the reason, the only reason I could have done something like this was because, was because of that big love. But what I was surprised by was the, the amount of, of, love inside of my heart for this person and how through all the work I have done over the years internally, you know, you don't know what's going to happen until you're there. You know, you can do all this work around forgiveness and, you know, whatever. And then you're there with the person and that's, that's the real, you know, that's the real deal. And there was no need to forgive. There wasn't anything to forgive. It doesn't mean I haven't worked towards forgiveness in time, but in that moment of meeting, the forgiveness was already complete. And so to me, what that means is, I didn't have the past stuck in front of me, breaking intimacy in such a way that I can't see who this person is, because all I can see is the history that I've put in front of us, or in front of me, or between us. 
and so that that was that was that was the most move that that was just so touching and because of that i could see that this person is good and i could tell them that i saw that they were good which was the first time anyone had ever told this person that they're my age they were they were about 19 when when it happened i was about 20 so we're we're roughly the same age no one's ever told him that he's that they're that he's good and so there was something quite beautiful in that yeah there's a a really interesting subtlety to the way we were talking about the present inheriting and blending with the past and this notion of having the past in front of you as an obstacle you know, what's you know what does it take as like a yoga move <laughs> to switch the one into the other <laughs> well i i i think um I think the simple answer is that it requires going inside and feeling in, in Chinese medicine, we, we would say that, that these places of injury, are, we might call them congealed blood. The idea is that blood has the awareness of spirit in it. And so when, when, um, when blood is congealed, there's a way in which we take the consciousness or awareness out of this fluid medium. And then we're left with sort of a putrefying uh, latency of harm, assumptions, trauma, injury, something like that. Which, by the way, is also how uh, malignant tumors form, just, just as, a, as a side note. Um, and so there's an invitation, I think, in instead of having that congealed blood, which has like a, it's like a, a, a snow globe that has this like re repetitious world in it that we kind of put in front of us instead of doing that we we own it and we 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 bring it close and we allow transmutation to happen so that it unravels so that living history that's been congealed uh and holding agony it begins to un unfurl and unwind discovering its own potential now the thing i want to make clear too is I am talking about a whole world that has been congealed, not just like a part of me. I'm not just working with like a little Alexander. I'm working with all of the parts of the human collective that were represented in that world. That includes Herbert. It includes the three other men that were part of the, 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 the crime that happened. All of the family and friends that were at the funeral. All of these things can be looked at as features of the whole. And so the invitation is, is to embrace all of that, bring it all close, and allow it to find its, um, allow it to come to fruition. Then it's integrated and it's not stuck in front like some sort of a, um, you know, a blood clot. That, that, that doesn't allow me to see the, the person in front of me, who's also been growing for the last 27 years. So then I can see that. Mm, the two principles that really stand out to me from that are inclusivity and circulation. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that inclusivity inclusivity with love facilitates circulation right it's what allows the the blood clot to start to break up and to begin to flow again through the whole circulatory dynamics which then comes back into contact with awareness and gets sort of reabsorbed as a living history that is not latent but living history that is now singing the glories of potentiality and poss of human possibility where we've, we know, we all know this. We have a, we have a rough history. We've hurt, we've hurt each other so terribly. And yet I think those can also be held as seeds for, um, seeds for discovering what we're really capable of, which in this case includes forgiveness.
thinking about having this conversation with you, I've been thinking about your mm, love for unpacking symbols and translations from Eastern wisdom, which puts me in mind of my own periodic attempts to do my own translations of the Tao Da Ching, which is a book that's been with me since I saw it on my parents' shelf when I was a little kid. Uh, I've, I'm I'm never happy with the translations, and I'm always happy with the translations. There's so many different ways to appreciate it. And my partner has been, she's doing some home repairs she's taken on in the upstairs floor, and she's been listening to a Tao Da Ching translation as she does it. So we've been having these conversations. Um, curious about your history with that book and um, favorite passages. What stands out? Which pieces of it do you, you know? continue to travel with you and nourish you yeah well uh, i guess there's two there's two things i'd like to share here one I'll, I'll i'll just respond directly to the question that this this book the evolutionary gestures um are essentially this book is about learning how to count to five and how these five evolutionary gestures form evolution's engine and then we look at how that engine iterates through the human world to uh, give rise to um, developmental um, waves or developmental stages. And so the, the, the primary passage that I'm uh, interested in at the moment is the one that says, you know, uh, the Tao gives birth to one one gives birth to two, two gives birth to three, three gives birth to the 10,000 things, which is the same quality as four. And then when we add four plus the unifying ink of one, this gives us evolution's engine. It gives us the, the primary contours um, of, you could say, the liquid light bones of existence. Um, you know, sometimes Wilbur has talked about um, wanting... Uh, as the most reduced metaphysics as possible, um, which I, I like. I like the spirit of that desire um, to then leave the rest to evolution. It sort of has some some features that can be helpful for for some ways that certain minds work. And so we could say in this case, um, evolution's engine would be a very minimal that that passage would sort of represent the most minimal metaphysics that I'm that I'm aware of um, that would then give us enough contours, spaces um, within which the rest of the cosmos could, um, could take shape. We've developed this thing where we have uh, professors of philosophy <laughs> and this idea that philosophy is some kind of um, over full intellectual exercise that moves you away from life. But what I see the ancient people who we call philosophers doing is really trying to zero in on the most minimal structure of reality that it's possible for them to participate in and wanting to do that because they feel that that changes them somehow that the the intensity of that contemplation the the degree of truth that is as true as one plus one equals two when you find that you're like oh i can't i can't get more basic than this what that does to you is interesting it feels like it makes you more robust and more streamlined and more vibrant uh what's it like for you to come across in contemplation something that feels like a piece of the most minimal luminous bones of reality <laughs> well I, I what what excites me about it is I I feel that it it helps us come into contact with our unbroken continuity Jeremy Johnson talks about the continuity fold you know where there's this sort of these folds that you know if you if you zoom in they look like separate lines but when you zoom out it's just it's one continuity fold that's that's you know unfolding and when 
when there's a recognition of a sort of primordial liquid that has certain ways in which it moves, even though there's five evolutionary gestures, there's really only one evolutionary gesture. It just takes on variations such as receptivity or activity or interrelation, you know, relationship or um, interreflection, interdependency. But but you know, to me, it's an invitation to see all the way through to the unifying ink. Not not conceptually. It's why my book is so wild, and why I've. I've gone the route of writing in poetic prose and allowing, you know, liquid, li you know, liquid butter to, you know, drip from the rafters from the cinnamon yellow sun, because I want to e invoke the place in our soul that responds to story and real human experience so that we might be willing to um, hang out long enough to learn some of the distinctions in an embodied way that would actually allow us to see through the world far enough to see that it's all one taste. You mentioned Wilbur, and of course, he famously has a book called One Taste. And he brought into his integrative meta theory um, the two truths doctrine that we associate with the Tibetan Tsongkhapa, who I call him Onion Valley Man because it's the translation and it's fun. It's a great name. And the two truths doctrine is basically that the unconditional and the conditional reality can be. Mm, simultaneously affirmed as valid and true both they can both be comprehensively true of our reality and that's a really nice way to be able to say yes i affirm the ancient notion of a a, a timeless transcendent unconditional unchanging reality while also being a philosopher of evolutionary change and it allows us to do little kind of conceptual tricks where we like, well, the change list doesn't change, but as the changing changes, it becomes transparent in different ways to the change list. That's pretty good. I'm always curious, could we do better? <laughs> What's, um, do you have any hunches about what might go beyond the two truths model? Well, I can give it a go, and you can you can tell me if if it's <laughs> if it's something different. Um, you know, it says you know the Tao gives birth to one, and then so on and so forth gives birth to all these things. So we can look at um, the character for the it's called Shen, which is often translated as spirit. And, and it shows on the, the left side, it shows basically something that is hanging from heaven. It, 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 it's often thought of as like the sun, the moon, and the stars. But I would suggest we don't think about it too concretely and think at it, about it more like these luminous fruits that are hanging from heaven. And then, of course, on the right side, there's, there's a, it's a lightning bolt. It's a... It's a, a, a something again from heaven that's descending to earth that's uh it's numinous and it's it has impact so we can think about this notion of the Tao giving birth to these luminous fruits or another way to say it because the Tao it's kind of used a lot these days may or may not carry meaning anymore but essentially the timeless boundless emptiness that isn't empty, but it is empty. It's not empty like deficient of something. It's just crystal clear and omnipresent. And that somehow out from there burps this lumen, these luminous fruits, this evolution's engine, that these fruits have seeds that then begin their birthing. But these seeds or these five evolutionary gestures, they are simply as the liquid bones of, of existence, they are creative spaces. 
that are not determining form. So it, it sort of removes some of this uh, fate and determinism kind of stuff that everything that's ever been created has already been created as some sort of something. Um, I, I mean, that, that's a fine way to be, but in, in the discussion and exploration of evolution, I like to consider maybe there's another way to hold it, that we have these sort of essential threads and then there's room for the creative impulse to discover, oh, what would it be like to work with these five gestures and create molecules? What would it be like to work with these five gestures and create tulips? And I, I'm saying it as if there's sort of like a, a being that's doing the creating. I don't, I don't mean it that way. I, I mean, there's these, these movements that get to uh, discover themselves as the creative features of the 10,000 things. So the Tao Te Ching one, that's yin. Yin is the, the, the sort of the uh, undivided potentiality. Two is the erotic arrow that, that, draw, that, that flies out to create differentiation. So now you have yin and then you have yang. Then you have the three space, which is the, the middle, the median line of the yin-yang symbol. That's now the relationship between yin and yang. And this, of course, is where the impulse for evolution occurs because three gives birth to the 10,000 things. From this interaction of yin and yang comes the proliferation of diversity. But then how that expresses itself is unique and creative to all sorts of things. And at the same time, the 10,000 things are never separate from these liquid light bones. And so that's where you start to see the continuity between the, uh, the groundless ground that burps fruit from the, you know, the ceiling floor to the other groundless ground where from the earth grows you know, protons into you know, everything else that it comes after. Um, we start to see that there is a whole unification there and an undividedness while also accounting for an incredible amount of evolutionary creativity and novelty. Um, so I don't know. Uh, that's how I hold it. Does that address? It does in a very interesting way. Um, I Years ago, I was working on the problem of post-metaphysics or you know, integral post-metaphysical yeah. spirituality and like yeah. what what metaphysics is actually implied by a post metaphysical universe <laughs> yeah and what what do we what do we gesturally presuppose when we think in terms of pluralism integralism or non dualism right and it's like there's different degrees of how closely packed different perspectives are when i think about the two truths doctrine it's already closer than the way it's normally held like some people would be no there's just a conditional reality and some people make the, no, there's just the unconditional reality. It's like they're there, but they're far apart. And then Onion Valley Man puts them close together. I mean, like, could they get even closer? And when I've tried to think about them getting even closer, it involves weird little structures. You know, you have to think the being of becoming and the becoming of being and have some kind of Mobius strip thing that brings them really tightly together. But that's sort of... Um, an algebraic way to do it, right? Like you're doing it on two sides of an equal sign on a chalkboard. The way you're describing it is, and I like it, it's more computational in a way that the the thing that connects and goes beyond just having those two is the recurrent or fractal unfolding of a series of steps through time, right? Unfolding and returning and being modified. So that's, I think there's a lot of, they both have a utility, but in some ways I think the the temporal metaphor of unfolding steps probably has an advantage going forward into a world of computation. Yeah, and 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 you know the other thing that comes up as I'm listening is you know we can think of these as evolutionary gestures. We can also think of them as uh, uh, evolutionary spaces. And it reminds me of that article that uh, Alderman Bruce Alderman wrote about um, the different like grammar. And, and the different sort of aspects of grammar. And you can look at these five gestures 
from the perspective of the creation of pronounal spaces, pronounal spaces being that which comes before nouns, the, the, uh, the, the I, the we, the it, the it's, this, this four quadrants that many people are so familiar with, that these are spaces within which the 10,000 things can proliferate and are in some ways shaped by those spaces. If you have a we space, then to, you know there's a room for something to interact with something. If you don't have that we space, or if you don't have the three space, then you don't have that. So what I love about this is that um, where, where it resonates with me is that there is an allowance for unlimited creativity. And of course, this is something that um, in this book, I'm showing how this creates, in essence, Terry O'Fallon's stages model. And that's something that's really precious in her discovery, is that these, what she would call parameters, these developmental parameters are spaces, so that we are not as fixed on developmental content well, if you wear patchouli and you're wearing a tie-dye shirt and you, you know, are an undergrad at Naropa, then you're going to be at this stage probably. What we're actually then looking at are the underlying developmental structures. So someone may dress like that and smell like that and, and kind of have that archetypal feel to them. And yet they might be totally coming from a modernist, you know, or, you know, in sort of people, I don't know what languages people have listening here, but like an orange or a 3.5 kind of um, orientation, they might be wholly in that set of perspectives, but look like a hippie, smell like a hippie, talk like a hippie. And when we're able to see to these underlying structures, then we can see those the sort of the primordial st developmental structures that are present. And then we get to see how that human being has become creative given the world they're in relationship with and what they've what they've absorbed and taken on and then their own unique exploration so not only does this give room for evolutionary creativity in general i feel that it also can give more evolutionary creativity for each individual as we explore any particular developmental territory it's not fixed. You're not going to be like this because people said you, you know, you're this stage. You actually get to explore it and broaden it out exponentially um, to sort of unpack that terrain. Mm, yeah, thinking about spaces rather than content developmentally reminds me of um, the way I've sort of traditionally done it was to think about the difference between content and style. Mm. Right, that there's a way of doing it, yeah. <laughs> regardless of what you're saying. Just like my, I, I always pointed this out as like an art thing. I can draw a picture of the Buddha. That's not a more spiritual picture than Van Gogh's painting of dirt. It's not yeah. in the content, it's in how they did it. Yeah. Uh, so there might also be um, like a degrees of style. Uh, or a sense that you can get from people and from artifacts that show how much they've brought the changing and the changeless into proximity with each other, even though the content might not tell you that. Yeah, beautifully said. You mentioned Bruce Alderman. He and I used to have a lot of discussions about what's a better translation of Nagarjuna's term shunyata than emptiness? And and it was Onion Valley Man, I think, who gave the, the Tibetan translation sounds like emptiness when you translate it into English. Is that a good translation of, of what Nagarjuna was trying to say? Bruce prefers spaciousness. Mm -hmm. I prefer indiscernibility. Mm -hmm. um, emptiness is a functional word like you can use it as a to orient meditation you can use it to uh, give the impression that there's something valuable in surrender and self-transcendence and disidentification like you're not falling into a horrible void there's a lovely emptiness there <laughs> uh, but philosophically i wrestle with it i wrestle with it from the point of view of um is emptiness, is nothingness, is absence per se thinkable? 
And yes, we could say, well, I don't really mean an absence. I mean a particular presence that reminds people of an absence. They're like, okay, then are we using the wrong word when we say absence or nothing or emptiness? And if it's not really thinkable, if emptiness is empty of emptiness, then are we smuggling non-thinkables into our thinking system? And yeah. is there a risk of nihilism, of like undermining our thinking? We have a world map that includes things that can't be on a world map. Is there something suspicious there? Uh, what's your general take on the word itself? Where is it yeah, useful? I'm, Where is it uh, suspicious? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Um, I mean, I think we run into a problem here because, I mean, the, you know, the, 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 another phrase that's offered is that, you know, the, the true Tao can't be named. So I think that's the problem that we run into is that we're trying to describe something that's apprehended beyond the mind, beyond the thinking mind. Um, and it's a direct experiencing of, you know, some of the, the most essential I like to talk about it as the canvas, but even that is a problem because of course a canvas is inside of space and time, but it's as a way to, uh, I think we have to end up using metaphor to describe something that is only apprehended directly. So we can say, okay, well, the canvas, the Tao is the canvas. And then the, the number one, the first gesture is a single stroke across a canvas that's like the sky. You know, like we can say things like that. I like diaphaneity because when there's a relationship to what we might call emptiness, there is a sense that there is a non a non-locatable something that's not a something that's everywhere and nowhere, but at the very least we can say that when we're uh, non-conceptually connected to that, that not thing passes through trees. But it's not passing because it's not moving. But yet somehow you, the tree becomes diaphanous. It's almost like we, we really can only talk about emptiness from fullness because that's where words are coming from and our capacity to create symbols. And so I think that's why we run into trouble and there's probably no right word. Um, but I relax more uh, with diaphaneity because it's speaking to an experiential function or ex an experience of this thing that can't be named in relationship to objects that can be named. So then we can start to say things like, oh, well, everything feels very dreamlike because this thing that doesn't pass through is somehow passing through without movement, everything. And the more we identify with that diaphanous, clear light, the more everything else seems to be sort of dreamy and where I guess it's sort of existence is brought into question. It's, 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 it's ontological certainty is brought into question. Um, but with all that said, I don't think there's a there's a word that really is going to do it because it's so beyond. I think I think we should keep trying though, because I think that um, language will eventually evolve, and it has evolved to allow us to describe things in certain ways. And as a result, language has this differentiative birthing power. So the more we we grapple with trying to talk about these fine distinctions of something that's timeless and boundless, um, it may help us awaken more to the features that can't be named ultimately. Yeah, I think I feel like it's a worthwhile exploration and and diaphaneity is is a great word for many reasons it has a certain freshness to it it reminds us that there's there's more in gebser than we've unpacked yet and it's a it's a beautiful sexy word it's like a cathedral yeah. or something that's right um we're never going to get it right we're playing with metaphors but we also know that our metaphors can get more precise and more powerful as they have done in some of the sciences yes and for me, one of the issues is 
And it's a hard one because we're playing in areas where reciprocal and paradoxical and alternating structures are very common. To what degree do the notions we're talking about form a single something? And to what degree might we be conflating several things? And I, I, I won't really know until I've unpacked it under the hypothesis that it might be separate things. I used to get really angry with, like if I read a book and it would say like, you know, God or the universe or the life force or emptiness or whatever you want to call it. And I would throw the book down because <laughs> it, there, there's no necessary reason why those are synonyms for each other. They may refer to completely different phenomenologies. Yeah. Uh, so when I think about what does it sound to me like I'm hearing people say when they say emptiness? And it sounds to me like they're saying several different things, and I don't know how together those things are or are not. I think some of them are saying uh, they've grown. A new a layer, a new stage has opened for them, and they're experiencing it as a contrast to all of their previous content, and it hasn't filled up yet with a personality. It's, it's waiting for them. It's an availability. I think some of them are saying, and this is the hardest one for me to language, I want to say maximum coherent asymmetry. Like, when we say there is one, we say that one is like, equal to all the other numbers and we've just canceled all the other numbers and like that whole thing <laughs> or or we say there's nothing right whether we can really say that or not we're saying a something that cancels all these other differences um there is only every time we say there is only or imagine a a singular eternalized omnipresent variable something like that as emptiness points at that there's also I th very things that could be finite, right? Just like the atmosphere or a, a life energy or something like that. There might be something that's very big and transparent and wonderful, uh, but is certainly a positive substance and not even necessarily infinite. And then there's the like purely paradoxical, the, the coherent interweaving thing the thing when non-duality would be distinguished from causal mysticism where you would have to say emptiness but also not emptiness <laughs> yeah. something like that so i hear and we did this in a bit of a discussion the other day i hear at least those four things and maybe more if i thought about it more i'm curious whether you think those all fit together nicely oh. or or what your own sense of yeah. of what what people might be pointing at differently when they use terms for that which we don't seem to be able to ever have a perfect term for. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we get, I think we have to be careful when we're trying to define some sort of ontological reality. Because if we do that without knowing we're doing that, then we're going to start limiting the fullness of the world or the the fullness of the thing that doesn't exist in the world, whatever it is we're talking about, there's going to be some degree of, of limitation. And, and I feel my experience, for example, is that, you know, if we can hold um, that our, our perspective and the arising worlds kind of occur together, then it allows for God to have infinite amount of, of, uh, faces that one could apprehend so for example if i'm you know uh, sitting in a where i'm listening to a meditation guided by dan brown there's a certain quality of uh, diaphanous clearness that opens in the space as an invisible ontological ink and then maybe I listen to or sit with, you know, Dustin Deperna, and I feel that same thing. But but then there's there's this there's a quality of sweetness, and and warmth. Or then maybe at another moment I'm sitting in meditation without listening to others, 
And there is a quality of rich, beyond human love that's just pouring through. I think if we try to divide these things up too much to then say which one God is, we, we might run into some trouble. On the other hand, if we're allowed the recognition that enlightenment maybe isn't exactly the same, this gives rise to, you know, um, what I think many are pointing to, that we have to account for pluralism. We have to account for the we space. We have to account for the sympoetic, you know, co-arising of whatever it is that's happening here. And that perspectives indeed grow up, at which point enlightenment must also grow up. And with each perspective, even if you have a bunch of people that are basically onto the same thing, in a way they may each be tuning into a slightly different way of experiencing. Because I can go and experience, oh, this it's like this crystal clear nothingness that's definitely noticeable. But then there might be other times where it feels like the room is pregnant with sort of this liquid golden thing that I'm not visualizing. This isn't like seeing an aura. It's like this omnipresent, all-knowing. And so I think there's this way in which that there's we can try to differentiate. And then we also, I, I want to invite that there's a way that we don't limit I'm not suggesting you're doing this, but just in, 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 in reference to your question, that we don't limit what these qualities that aren't qualities that are qualities could be. Because as, you know, maybe enlightenment goes on forever. And it's the beginning of a learning and a discovering that also doesn't have an end rather than sort of how I used to think of it, you know, in my 20s was like, oh, like you reach enlightenment and like, I don't know, then you, I guess you drink tea and like retire or something where it's like, oh, maybe that's actually the beginning of a discovery that is uh, uh, infinitely nuanced. And maybe some of those things haven't been fully discovered. Maybe there's an evolutionary dimension to something there too. I, I don't know, but that's at least my uh, my experience that each day there's more of this thing that isn't a thing. I feel it's sort of almost unquestionable for me that the ongoingness and the diversity, uh, even the idiosyncrasy of these things uh, is a more accurate way of talking than the impression we get from some traditional sources of, of a singular path and a once and for all transition. And when you're speaking, the not limiting it too much, the too much stands out to me and the maybe stands out to me because I, as far as I could tell, I'm not in a position to be able to determine whether something is infinite or not, <laughs> right? I'm like, it may be, like, it's like the digits of pi. Maybe they go on repeating forever, or maybe at some point we find that, oh, well, you just need a hundred trillion of them and then it repeats. <laughs> there right. might be a limited number of, of forms of this. It just might be so great, I'll never run into that limit. I don't know. Uh, it makes me think of fractals where you can, if you've ever done like a fractal zoom on a computer, you can go forever, but you keep coming across the same shape no matter how far you go. You're like, okay, so it's not exactly limited, but it's not exactly unlimited either. It's somewhere exactly. between those. Absolutely. And, and, you know, my sense is, is that when we're, when human beings are in these spaces, where the inquiry is no longer a conceptual inquiry, but a direct perception, there's a way in which there's, there's simply a, a wholeness delighting in a wholeness delighting in the experience of itself. 
And it's more of a sense of being in a sacred world that is forever mysterious and forever, well, I say forever, it ex I experience it as an undying luminosity and sacredness along with a mystery not a conceptual mystery, but a, a sense of delighting in and a curiosity in sensing what other contours might pop without really a notion of if, if there are an infinite of those or not. And I suppose at that point, it, it's so glorious, it doesn't even arise as a care. But what does arise is the one being present to its own capacity for self-liberation or self-awakening in the form of a luminous world discovering its, its, uh, all these unique contours that may go on forever. And maybe there's a moment where you're like, okay, this is as amazing as it gets or something <laughs> at that point though i suspect there's probably not a mind separate from that whole thing that's doing much of anything i sometimes have a notion of a kind of existential thermostat and it's probably like you go into these spaces and you're like oh this is pretty total and pretty already completely satisfied <laughs> yeah. and you go okay you get to like 90 percent, and you're like mm, what's your motive for going to 91 percent? going to 92 percent? the moto drops radically does anybody ever get to 100 or by the time you get to 98 you're so close you can't even you don't have enough dissatisfaction to take the next step <laughs> right i'm sure that can happen i'm sure that can happen and and then of course there's 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 all the places of uh, suffering in the world that are also a feature of that sacred world. And so I, I suppose at some place where there would be some satisfaction enough or a no, you know, probably long before that the seeker has, has trailed away anyway. And it's really just uh, a wholeness awakening to itself because it's delightful and happening automatically, that there would also then be um, a turning towards all of the suffering. It's again, a, res a respecting um, the ancestral blood <laughs> that's, ex that's existing um, inside of our individual forms and, 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 and inside of everything that's happening in the world to, re, to make sure that no stone has been unturned, left, left unexplored. Because, you know, what we've been talking about here is that sort of move towards sort of this transcendent glory of, of uh, omnipresent, all-pervading being. But that's only part of the, everything. <laughs> That's actually only part of the 10,000 things. And like a lot of those 10,000 things have scraped their knees and are screaming wretchedly, you know? And I think there's a whole nother degree of courage, at least for me, to be able to turn towards all of that and see the sacredness and the unity and the one taste in that. Yeah, there's something that I was almost going to describe as classical, but I have no proof of that. It's it's classical in my own mind that uh, as one moves through a certain kind of developmental journey and feels certain degrees of success, that there's at least two further kinds of things. One is, can that process replicate it more and more strongly in different aspects of our being? And also, an expansion from the personal to the transpersonal identity and a replication of the same process for larger and larger 
group, fields of intelligence where we are collectives. The others, more of the others are on the inside and the whole thing has to be repeated at those scales. That's right. Yeah. Because if we're talking about, you know, if we're talking about wholeness, if we're talking about an interdependent whole, there are no outsiders. And so it has to include everything. And so I think there's that way that, you know, this is where, you know, the, 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 the fruits, you know, are, you know, fall from heaven and then they plant and then they grow their way back towards the sun. But enough, that, that's sort of looking at it in a bit of a linear way where there's involution and then there's evolution. But, but really, I, I, I think the whole, uh, the whole interdependent cosmos is simultaneously involving itself and evolving itself. That the, that the one that those fruits they, they I mean I was speaking about those fruits as transcendent fruits but we could also look at it for example I mean I live in Boulder and you know my daughter has gone to a Waldorf school and most of the parents have some degree of pluralistic uh impulses to embrace many perspectives and what we see is that then those those values, get poured into the children as uh, an involutionary planting of, you could say, some degree of heavenly fruits. I mean, the ability to recognize that people have different perspectives and that they should be honored and loved in those perspectives, like if we really brought that to fruition, man, that, that, would, be a, that would be a thing. And so then, those, so then the, the one as the adult collective are pouring those values into the children so that then they, even though they're at an early development, earlier developmental waves, they will at some point grow those values up so that by the time they are experiencing, you know, 4.0 or, or green, whatever we, we call it, once they grow up there, they've now grown up a new 4.0 that is going to be more developed, more, uh, more, uh, there's more fruit than what their parents had because their parents were pouring that in. So we can look at it from like the big, you know, heaven plants fruits with this sort of like this, this ominous kind of big beingness thing that sort of in some ways takes us out of our direct experience in some ways. But we can look at how that process of involution and evolution is occurring right now everywhere. And so the transcendent is always pouring in to the newly emergent and and they're 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 teaching each other i you know i learn and grow i i grow in relationship to my my teen age daughter growing and then that in turn creates a different kind of what's pouring into her that then she's going to grow up and sort of you know bring that bring that to her you know further collectives the um, the notion of higher, deeper, and emergent things becoming instantiated at at earlier and more basic levels. It's a beautiful image of of an evolutionary engine. It has, on the one hand, uh, the potential defect form, or the deficient form is people take on the higher things in the lower style. And then, and then can't tell the difference as to what the right. real authentic version is. And that happens. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you have tremendous opportunity if you're able to healthily encounter these things earlier. And I think one of the opportunities that we've seen in our kids coming back out of schools where, you know, racism and bullying and monolithic thinking are a problem is they clearly internalize some of it, but it comes early enough that it's a thing for them to grow beyond as well. And they right. develop a certain kind of constructive cynicism about it because it's the pervading doctrine of the institution. And I think the the friction, the struggle between uh, having these things and having some way to critique them and allowing that to generate new forms is really important. And I also got an image of struggle thinking about suffering as well. Like uh, suffering is, it's like it needs to be intentional you need to suffer on purpose otherwise you're just suffering but also it's not merely the 
duplication of the pain of others. It's, it's a feeling that that shouldn't be, that there's a struggle of some kind, that it's suffering when you, you have a, a, a fact, a sensation, and a no to that. And mm -hmm. if you don't get trapped there, if they are allowed to rub up against each other long enough, then some kind of transmutation takes place. And that the intentionality and the friction really stand out to me as essential principles. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, you know, the suffering isn't suffering without that. No, you know, other than that, if, if, if you take out the no, it's just sensation, <laughs> you know? And, and so I, I think that's one of the keys is to how do we, how do we learn to take care of the no so that we can bring, you could say, since I brought up Waldorf school, you bring the loving arms ar around those those sensations, and that becomes that relationship. We looked before the three space. That's the generative. That's what allows evolution to occur. You bring you bring these sensations of of what was suffering. You you remove the no by turning towards from deeper presence, deeper resources, and engage in a certain kind of relationship. And it's that relationship that then allows the evolution or the transmutation or the inner alchemy. Um, into its deeper potential, which we could look at as going back to a more essential source. We could also look at it as evolving forward into a new quality of being. I would, you know, I'm not going to say which one it is. We either one works. What we end up with is some sort of luminous, luminous fruit that makes us enter the world from a place of virtue without trying. Right. Sometimes, you know, virtue can mean living from virtue can mean I make myself be good, which is great in a pinch, but it doesn't go well long term because once you get tired, then you end up in jail. The other option is to explore this transmutation process so that that luminosity is just pouring through. It's pouring through. So virtuous action is just. Um, it's the only thing you could conceive of. That reminds me of passages in the Tao Da Ching, you know, where, you know, virtue becomes the issue when the Tao has been forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> right. There is something about a, a kind of development that is more whole being, in some ways more subconscious, that you end up being surprised by the fact that you are thinking, feeling, and behaving differently rather than having heard from others that it would be good to do that and striving to do so. Even though, as you say, in a pitch, that's better than a society where people are not doing that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, it reminds me that, um, so the character, the Chinese character for virtue, it basically, um, it, it shows a complete set of eyes 10 eyes. It's a complete set of eyes or eyes that are looking in every direction. And then they see there's a, a, a single line. It's like the number one. Um, they look in every direction and they see no deviation. And then underneath that is the character for the heart. Right. And then, and, and as another part of that is, is basically it's, it means to walk with. So I I'm, I'm walking in such a way that my heart is emanating something that if we were to look at what is pouring from me, if we were look, to look at what was pouring from me, we would be able to look in all directions and we'd see no deviation. Now, this character, it has a, a relationship to another character, which essentially means to listen. And so the idea is when you listen to the Tao, virtue is going to be an emanation of what is inevitable, inevitable. Um, from looking uh, in Chinese uh, medicine, we'd say turning north which means it's the yin direction. It's looking within all the way to our deepest essence of being. So then when we turn south, which is looking towards the world, that's the yang expression. We're basically from the origin from which bubbles out virtue. And then that's how we walk. And then that comes through listening, listening to those, those murmurs of, of this thing that we can't really define. I would like to 
see what you look like with just a little mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I think that could suit you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I would be, I would, uh, I would certainly do well with a mustache. I, I used to have quite a long, uh, you might not know, but my, my hair's red. I, I used to have a long red beard. My, my wife, Veronica, she, she's not as amenable to facial hair uh, as, um, so anyway, so thus I have an empty, yeah. an empty it's... face. It's scratchy and it fills up with decaying food matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it certainly does. It's also a great a great way to um, uh, spend your money on rosemary oil. But you know, <laughs> no, I um, to be silly at the beginning, I introduced you as not a bad lacrosse player, and I have no reason to think you are a lacrosse player. But what do you do, and what have you done? um for sport for physical exercise what's your yeah. what's the health of your body like <laughs> yes um i love crossfit i've been doing crossfit for about eight years ten years a bunch of years um a few years ago um, my daughter's teacher challenged the parents to just invite their kid to do something for four weeks in the summer so i i invited her to come to crossfit and then she she became uh really into it also so that's um uh, that's the main kind aside from walking um that's the main kind of um uh, exercise stuff that i like to do uh, have you watched the crossfit games yes i love the crossfit games <laughs> absolutely i would like to see that's what i i would you know if the pageantry was more i prefer that to the olympics because the element mm -hmm. of surprise yeah. in the activity you're going to have to underdo yeah. that speaks to something much greater than just training for a narrow physical specialization totally oh yeah i love it i i, I love watching the games and one time one of the guys he usually gets in like the top four or five he came to our gym because our gym our gym uh is owned by two people um one of those people is the guy who owns all of crossfit um and so sometimes like famous crossfitters will kind of wander in and out and so that was really excited exciting for sophia and i be like oh my god that's that's i think it was patrick Vellner. it's like that's Vellner. Woo! he's right there well i guess we got to bring this thing to an end but you and i could obviously do this all day and we probably should come back again and try to theorize what uh spiritual crossfit would look like <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know that that I'll just say that that comes back to something I think you're mentioning before. I can't say it the way that you did, but but you know, can we do CrossFit without losing touch with this unnameable sacred world? At what point does it become intense enough that something contracts and it just we we think we're a human being suffering you know, jumping up and down on a box that's in a way self-inflicted because we did show up for class. And and what does it take to be able to allow whatever realization has occurred in any of us that's listening, what does it take to bring that into as many contexts of our lives as possible? And there's a degree of practice in that where, you know, the awakening, as I think Wilbur said, like happens by accident, right? But then how do we intentionally uh, broaden that uh, as wi as widely as possible into as many contexts as possible. So anyway, just wanted to toss yeah. that in there. Wilbur's, Wilbur talks about how to become more accident prone, but we also have to think, well, can we increase the types of accidents and the range of the accidents That's and right. the likelihood exactly. that more people will have accidents? That's right. uh, yeah, this was great. I look forward yeah. to co-tracking and hanging out uh, more in the future. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Layman. It's super fun. Yeah.